Have you ever had the fear that someone might secretly be living in your house without your knowledge? Well, what if I told you it was much more common than you might think? Today, we're going to talk about one such case and give you a pretty good reason to start checking your attic. The date is October 17th, 1941, and in a small home in Denver, Colorado, the body of 73-year-old Philip Peters is found mutilated on his bedroom floor by his neighbor. The man's head is caved in, with brain matter and blood splattering the carpet. Next to his corpse lies his walking stick and two halves, the broken pieces of a handgun, and a heavy iron stove shaker. Police are baffled. Philip Peters was a saint, a man loved by all who knew him without an enemy in the world. Furthermore, nothing had been stolen, so it wasn't a robbery. But the circumstances that confused police the most were that every door and window in that house had still been locked from the inside. The police searched the house, but found absolutely nothing. The case had no leads, but the community had their own theory as to how Peters had lost his life. Paranormal activity. For weeks before he had died, neighbors had noted odd occurrences in the home. Lights turning on and off, doors opening on their own accord, thin shadows passing in front of windows. The house of Philip Peters was haunted, and the murder had merely confirmed what they'd all suspected, that the presence inside was malevolent. At the time of his murder, Philip's wife, Helen, had been in the hospital for weeks recovering from a broken hip, and when she finally returned to the home, rumors grew even more. The housekeepers Helen needed to survive now that she was recovering on her own were terrified of the house. They claimed to keep seeing horrific, ghostly apparitions, hearing unexplainable noises from other rooms, and noticing things having been moved with no logical explanation. One by one, the housekeepers began to resign in fear. The final housekeeper fled the house claiming to have seen a pale, bony hand sliding around an open door. Helen could find no one to take care of her in that house and was forced to move in with her son and daughter-in-law, leaving the home vacant. But it wasn't vacant. Strange sounds and disgusting smells continued to be reported to the police, but they couldn't find anyone in the house. The investigation into the murder had long gone cold and police had never seriously paid attention to the supposed ghost that haunted the residence. Everything changed in July 1942, once Denver police stationed two police detectives, Roy Bloxham and Bill Jackson, outside the house to keep it under surveillance instead of waiting for a call from the neighbors. The vigilance paid off when Bloxham and Jackson spotted a man inside the house. They ran inside, but the house was empty. Until they heard a noise upstairs. They opened a closet door just in time to spot a pair of legs disappearing up into a small opening to the house's attic. They grabbed the legs and pulled the man attached to them back to the ground. It was not a ghost that had been haunting the Peters' home, but a scrawny, smelly man wearing ragged clothes and on the brink of starvation. The man fainted as they pulled him to the ground. The man they found was over six feet tall, but only weighed 75 pounds. The ambulance driver that examined him said it was the worst case of malnutrition I have ever seen. The suspect was arrested and taken downtown, where he confessed to his crime and told his story. Theodore Edward Conies was born in Illinois in the 1880s. His family briefly moved to Beloit, Wisconsin, before permanently relocating to their new home in Denver, Colorado, in 1907. Being a sickly boy, doctors assumed he wouldn't live past the age of 18. As a child, Coney's poor health meant he was never able to play outside with the other children. He spent his days practicing mandolin and never really developing any social skills or work-related skills for that matter. Why bother, he thought, when he thought he'd be dead before he would ever need to support himself. However, Coney's did not die, but at the age of 18 found himself out looking for a job in poor health and with no skills. As a teen, a friendly couple would occasionally invite Theodore over for dinner to make sure the boy was well fed. The couple was a young Philip and Helen Peters. Theodore Edward Conies eventually moved away and spent the next four decades desperately trying to survive while moving all across the country 
before finally returning to his hometown of Denver, Colorado. Starving and on the brink of death, 59-year-old Conies went to the home of the only people in town who had ever been kind to him, Philip and Helen Peters, hoping that they could give him money or even just something to eat. However, the couple was not home. At the time, Philip was with his wife, who had just recently been hospitalized for her broken hip. Conies, who was desperate, broke into the empty home looking for food. However, as he stood in the kitchen eating food he'd stolen from the fridge, he came up with a plan to survive. I thought this attic would become my shelter, he told detectives. I would sneak out at night and get bits of food from the icebox, and they wouldn't even know I was there. He searched the home and discovered that the entrance to the attic was hidden in the top of a closet in a room that looked like it was rarely used. The hatch to gain entry into the attic was small, so small that a man of average weight would never have been able to fit through the tiny hole. This wasn't an issue for the already malnourished Conies. Eventually, Philip Peters returned, with his wife still at the hospital, and began to notice odd things. Sometimes food would go missing. Sometimes he'd hear things he couldn't explain. Peters didn't think much of it, however, and Conies, secretly living above him, was very careful with what he stole and the sounds he allowed himself to make. Every night, he'd sneak down as soon as he heard Peters snoring. This worked fine, until one night, Peters awoke to find a tall, gaunt man in rags, digging through his fridge. Peters didn't recognize me, Coney said. I guess I've changed a lot in 30 years. The old man swung at Coney's with his cane, snapping it in the process, and Coney's retaliated by grabbing an old revolver that was hanging on the wall and bashing Philip Peters in the head with it. The old man began staggering to the bedroom. He said he was going to call the police, Coney said, so I followed him and hit him again. Coney's beat the man over the head with the revolver until it literally broke into pieces, but the old man was still twitching. Conies entered the kitchen, grabbing a sturdy metal stove shaker, and proceeded to beat the man nearly 30 more times in the head with it. He left Peters dead on his bedroom floor, covered in chunks of skull and brain matter, and returned to his hiding place in the attic. Since his wife had been in the hospital, most evenings Peters had been going next door to the Ross's home for dinner, so he wouldn't have to eat alone. That next evening, when he didn't show up for dinner, Jenny Ross came over to check on him, only to find him dead on his bedroom floor. Police investigated the home thoroughly, even discovering the hatch that led to the attic. However, they thought there was no way a person would possibly fit through such a small opening. Regardless, they still tried to open it to see inside. However, when it didn't budge, they assumed it was nailed shut from the inside and disregarded the attic entirely. In reality, the killer... Theodore Edward Conies had been lying directly on top of the hatch to prevent anyone from opening it. Police had literally been inches from the person they were looking for. For a while, he was alone in the house, able to move freely. However, within a few weeks, Philip's wife, Helen, returned. While this meant more food was brought in, it also meant more challenges. While Philip had been an old man with deteriorating hearing from years working on a railroad tracks, Helen's housekeepers were young and would hear every sound Conies would make. They also occasionally caught brief sightings of the man, which, to his relief, they attributed to spirits inhabiting the house. They never even conceived of the dark truth that a murderer was living right above their heads. Eventually, he'd frightened off the housekeepers and with them, Helen herself, leaving him all alone. There he stayed through the winter, almost freezing himself to death in the unheated house. For water, he would sneak to the roof to get snow to melt. He subsisted on cornmeal, preserves, and canned food he found in the basement. He described his months in the attic as a hellish, terrible nightmare. After he was caught, however, he found his life in jail almost a luxury compared to the way he'd been living. He was sentenced to life in prison after being declared legally sane by psychologists and went on to be described as a model prisoner until his death in 1967 at the age of 85. While it's easy to write off sounds you hear at night, or movement you think you might have seen in the periphery of your vision, sometimes it's best to take a second look. This case goes to prove that you never really know what could be living in your home right now. Thank you for watching We're Three Gnomes in the Dark. Remember to like and subscribe if you want to hear more content like this. 
If you found this interesting, please share it. As a new growing channel, we can't even begin to describe how much that really does help us out. Also, if you have any scary stories you know of, feel free to send them our way and they will very likely end up in one of our videos. Until next time, thank you for watching, and keep exploring the darkness.